All right, so let's start. So I'll be talking about exploring Stack Overflow data. So first, a little disclaimer. I am in a no way related to Stack Overflow. I am just a normal person, like you and I are. <laughs> I use Stack Overflow. I am not related to Stack Overflow in any other way. In fact, I am related with University of Cambridge, because this is where I work. And if you have never been to Cambridge, you should definitely go, because it's a, a very beautiful place. It looks like this. But then I work here, so let's <laughs> move on. Uh, I work actually in bioinformatics, and I help biologists analyze their biomedical data and get some insights on that and how to uh, basically analyze how cancer develops. So it's fairly complex uh, area because I'm not a biologist in any way. And the data that I work with, they look like this. It's not exactly interpretable. So these are the files that I work with. I don't have any idea what that means either, basically. Uh, so what I like to do is to play with some interesting data sets. So for example, I did social network analysis of Star Wars movies. This is the social network of all Star Wars movies. Well, it doesn't include the Rogue One yet. I should do that. Uh, it even got published in the French edition of Scientific American. But then when I actually looked at the article, this is like an introduction in the article. I don't speak any French, but I'm pretty sure this says that I'm from Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> this is as if you were Scottish and someone said, oh, you are from England, right? No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So let's never speak about this again and let's move on to Stack Overflow. So why Stack Overflow? Well, well we all do this, right? Well, in some degree. So everyone uses Stack Overflow. So I think this is a data set that every one of us can sort of relate to. And you can get quite a lot of data out of Stack Overflow. Well, you can either use their API, which is completely open. You can get quite a lot of information from that. But for a data scientist, that's kind of slow. So luckily, well, right now, about a month ago, they opened Stack Overflow data set on Google BigQuery. So now you can write your SQL queries and get insights from that. But this is only, this appeared a month ago. And I did this analysis a little while ago. So what I did actually, I used Stack Overflow data dump. And they publish this every three months. And every three months, you can download a fresh data dump for, of the entire Stack Overflow. All the data. That's kind of amazing, right? So how does the data look actually? Well, this is when I just looked at it in command line, and this is the column that shows the sizes of the files. So for example, post history is a single XML file that has 67 gigabytes. That's kind of big. <laughs> well, altogether, it's 135 gigabytes of XML files. Is this big data? Well, I wouldn't say it's big data, because it fits into RAM on my desktop. It doesn't fit into RAM on my laptop yet, but it fits into my desktop. So I can just load it into memory and work with it as if I had another smaller data set. So I wouldn't say this is big data, which is kind of nice because it makes everything easier to analyze. So I had 135 gigabytes of data. What shall I do with it? Well, that's the question. Like, what do I do with it? And this sometimes happens at work as well. Like a colleague comes and hands me over like a eight terabytes of hard drives with data and says, okay, here are your data. And I'm like, what shall I do with it? Well, and they say, well, the data, won't, they, won't the data tell you? <laughs> no, the data won't tell you what you need to know. You need to ask questions. And if you collaborate with any data scientists at work, they also need to ask questions. Because if you have data and they are complex, you don't get anywhere. You can look at correlations and like, plot variables against each other. But without questions, you don't get anything. And if you have big data, that's nice, but questions. Please remember that. Ask questions. So first question with Stack Overflow. This is actually the first question on Stack Overflow ever. And what I noticed is that they have tags which is amazing for a machine learning person. If something tells you, OK, this is the topic of the post, that's amazing. And this post has the tags C-sharp, WinForms, type conversion, decimal, and opacity. So it tells me a lot about what it's about. 
So my first question might be, like, what are the most common tags? Nice question. Well, Stack Overflow already tells you that. So this is just a screenshot from Stack Overflow, and the most common tags are JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, and PHP. So this is a complete valid question. It's not that interesting, because yeah, I could have guessed that probably JavaScript will be the most common one. But then I noticed that right here in the bottom, they also tell you how many questions were asked this week. So that's kind of more interesting. Uh, so instead of asking what are the most common tags, I decided to ask, so when do people actually ask the questions? So the first question is when. And I have some pre-processed data here. Uh, I'll be using F Sharp for my demos. So here I have a file. And it's actually about one and a half gigabytes of CSV files, because I pre-processed the XML files into CSV, because that's the data science format. And what can I do with it now? Well, luckily, F Sharp has some very nice features that I will show you a little. And one of them is called Type Providers. So this is over one gigabyte, so it's not very big, but it still takes some time to load it into memory if you want to work with it interactively. Well, luckily, I can use type providers, which is a very nice way to interact with data in F Sharp. And because this is a CSV file, I will use the CSV type provider. And I will explain a little bit what it does. So this file contains information on the tags and times when people were asking questions with a tag. So I will use the CSV provider. And I will just give it the address of the file. And that's all. And what this does behind the scenes is that it looks at the file, looks at the beginning, and tries to infer the structure of the file, including all the types that are in the file. So now I can actually load it. I can create a variable called tag time and load it in use the get sample method. And if I now do tag time uh, uh, dot rows, because it's a CSV file, it has rows, and I can, it can iterate over it. So now if I do row dot, uh, uh, come on, it tells me that the CSV file has three columns one is called day of week, the second one is called tag, and the third one is called time. So now, even without opening the file in Excel or whatever, I, can, I know the structure. And also, you can see that the tag is a string, time is system.datetime, so it inferred even that. And that makes working with these types of files much easier, because now I know exactly what's in there. And I don't even load anything in, anywhere. I haven't run anything. This is all happening in the type system. So this is incredibly useful. And you can see that it's reacting very quickly, even though it's a gigantic file underneath. So the CSV file, CSV type provider is the way to go if you are analyzing any of these data files. So I won't actually run anything, and I will show you some results. So when I run it, uh, this is, for example, for F Sharp, because I was using F Sharp. I first looked at F Sharp. So when are people asking F Sharp questions? So mostly it's Monday to Friday, and then it drops over the weekend. That kind of makes sense, right? Because people are at work Monday to Friday, so if they are working with F Sharp, they are using F Sharp questions. How does it look for C Sharp? It's very similar. But then I noticed that can you see that the ratio between the weekend and the weekdays is different? People are asking relatively more questions about F Sharp over the weekend than they are asking questions about C Sharp. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm up to something. Another interesting thing is that people are asking less questions on Monday and on Friday than the other weekdays. <laughs> Just an observation. So what do people do on weekends? Well, they work on their hobby projects. So this is my friend Chris, who actually wrote the Ionite plugin that I was using in VS Code for F Sharp. And this is him probably working on it on some weekend trip somewhere. So maybe he's asking a question on Stack Overflow about something. So on weekends, people work on hobby projects, on things that they don't have time to work on during the weekday. So let's formalize this a little. I will show you a very scientific graph. 
So this is the stuff that people do at work. When they work with something, they ask questions on Stack Overflow about it. This is the stuff that people work on on evenings, late at night, etc., whenever they can get time. And this will be fairly similarly distributed across weekdays and weekends. And then there is the stuff that people do in their completely free time, when they have time, actually, on weekends. So it can be either a lot when they really enjoy doing something and they don't have time to do that during the weekday, or it can be very little. It can be people stuck at work uh, asking hopeless questions because they have to solve something critical on week weekend. So if I look at the ratio of the number of questions that are asked during the week and that are asked during the weekend, it can tell me how people use uh, products or languages in their free time, basically. So if it's larger than one, that means people are using something more over the weekend than they are using it over weekdays. And if it's smaller than one, that means they are using it more during the week than on weekends. Everything clear so far? And the larger the value, the more people probably enjoy working with that technology in their free time. So the more, I will call this the weekend index. So the most weekend technologies, Minecraft. <laughs> so it kind of makes sense, right? People ask 20% more Minecraft questions over the weekend than during the week. Then LWJGL, it's this lightweight Java game library. SFML, this is simple and fast multimedia library that people use when they are writing games to do 2D graphics. Then D and Pi game. So it's mostly games. So that's interesting. People during weekends usually just play with games and are writing their own games, just for fun, probably. So any guesses on the most weekday stuff? <laughs> SQL Server Reporting Services 2008. <laughs> so these are the technologies that people like, wouldn't play with in their free time. And <laughs> and you can see that the ratio between the weekend and the weekday is very, very small. Like people ask 10% questions on weekend than they would ask on a weekday on SQL Server reporting services. All right, so now I plotted the most common tags. So they are fairly similar around 0 0.5. That means the number of questions drops by 50% over the weekend. And actually, the most uh, weekend stuff is Python. And the most uh, weekday language is C Sharp. So C Sharp is more enterprisey. C Sharp is more enterprisey than Python. I think we can agree on that. Uh, so how does it look for, let's say, functional languages? So. Down here, you can see Elm, which is now everyone's favorite functional language to write the web. And its index is actually larger than one. That means it's a very hobby language still, at least based on the, on the questions that people ask online. <coughs> and the least weekend language is actually Erlang, which has a very similar index to other mainstream languages. And then we have Scala, and then we have F Sharp. So people are probably actually using F Sharp in the industry because they are asking questions on Stack Overflow. And after Elm, the most weekend language is actually Haskell. So it seems a lot of people like to play with it in their free time. The index is almost 0 0.9. So it's mostly still a hobby language for a lot of people. So then I looked at some similar technologies. So for example, for continuous integration, we can use Jenkins, we can use Travis CI. This is a question from Stack Overflow, which was closed because it's opinion-based. So how does it look for the two technologies? Actually, Travis has much higher index than Jenkins. Any guesses why? They have very similar icons. <laughs> Now, the thing is that Travis is actually hosted for free for open source projects. And with Jenkins, you have to host it yourself. So if you are just working on some open source project or something hobby, then you would probably use Travis. And then you ask more questions on a weekend than you would use with Jenkins. So it kind of makes sense. 
So if you are doing something, think about who is your target user. If you want people to use your product in their free time, make it as easy as possible for them. So I think we covered like when are people asking questions? What can we do next? Well, I looked at some of the Stack Overflow profiles and I noticed this little item. It tells you where people are located. And I thought, well, it might be interesting to see where are people actually located who use different languages, because it differs for different countries. They use different languages in general. So my second question is, where are the people? And I looked at the data. Altogether, I have more than 5 million users that were registered on Stack Overflow, and almost 800,000 of them filled in their location. That's basically 15% of the entire use base. And if you are a statistician, then 15% of all people, that's a lot. So maybe we can get something out of that. So some of the uh, locations that people filled in look like this. Yeah. Dollar home, yeah, that's like a home address for some people. But actually, 83% of the people filled in a location that I could match to a country in the world. That's a lot. So some of them look like this. Unfortunately, Germany. It's still Germany. Uh, some people put in their address down to their office number. Maybe they expect someone to come and knock on their door and say, oh, thank you. That answer was brilliant. <laughs> it helped me so much. Some people put in their very specific address. I don't think they expect you to come knock on their door. I actually had to look this address up because this is so surreal. And it looks like this. So people are asking Stack Overflow questions everywhere. So, so where are the people? Well, first, 83% of the locations I could just determine by matching them to real countries in the world. What about the rest? Well, some of them were locations like London, which is pretty obvious where that is, or San Francisco, but it doesn't list an entire country. So I thought, well, maybe I can use some search engine, and I decided to use Bing, which provides location services. I used Bing purely because it gave me 250,000 requests for free. So I had, I think, about 120,000 locations that I couldn't determine easily. So I had two attempts to do that. Good. <laughs> and... Uh, as I mentioned before, I was using a CSV type provider that basically loaded a CSV file into my type system and allowed me to easily access that. And I can use uh, almost the same thing with REST-based services. So this is an example query that I can use for Bing uh, location services, and it returns a JSON. It's just a REST query. And I can do something similar that I did with the CSV file, but with a JSON now. So I will use a JSON provider. So I will first create a type. I will call it Bing search. And it will be a JSON provider, because this will return a JSON. And I can give it my sample request. And if internet works, it will get loaded into my type system. And now I can write a little function. I will call it locate. Uh, I will try to locate x. Maybe it's not a very good variable naming, but x marks the spot on a map. And I'm trying to locate x. And all I have to do is basically take this request that I had as an example and just modify it. And I will do mm, Bing search, load, and give it the example request. And all I have to do is change the location. Here it was Prague, because I am from Prague, but I will just change it into X. And that's basically all I need. Well, but because I am a nice programmer, I will try to clean it up a little. So I will save this. This is my response. And it's quite an ugly JSON format. So if I go to log dot, it tells me everything that's in the JSON that got returned from that request. And if I remember correctly, then the location is in resource sets, which is an array. 
and this is rs dot. And this is what that contains in the JSON because it's quite a big nested JSON. So I can look at resources and do again the same thing because it's a list of resources. And R dot, and we have address, nice. And the address contains country region. We have what we needed. So I think this returns a list of the closest locations to my query. I'll just change this to collect to get it into nice format. And for the first time today, I'm actually going to run something because we need to test it, right? So I'm running it in F-sharp Interactive. Mm -mm, it worked. So now I can do locate London. And London is most likely in the United Kingdom. Yes. <laughs> well, if I do something like locate Cambridge, because I live in Cambridge, it tells me most likely it's in the United States. And that's because all the best universities in the world are in Cambridge. Some of them are MIT in the US, and some of them are Cambridge in the UK. But if I do Cambridge University, it should find it, hopefully. And yes, Cambridge University is in the United Kingdom, most likely. So it's working. And this is what I used to get information where are all the rest of the programmers located. So how does it look? For example, this is JavaScript. And it's kind of boring, right? Well, there are a lot of programmers in the US, so obviously there will be more, C uh, more JavaScript programmers. And there are a lot of programmers in India, so of course there will be a lot of JavaScript programmers there. So nothing really interesting there. But what I really want to know is, among the population of programmers, how likely am I to meet a programmer that does the technology that I'm actually interested in? So, I created a new measure. Uh, so, if I compute basically the how many, n is the number of users that I managed to locate. So, if I compute the number of located users in the entire population of the country, and then scale it by a factor that tells me how likely people are to tell me their location, the details are not that important, then multiply it by one million for whatever reason, the, the, the unit of this measure is actually programmers per million PPM. <laughs> so if I compute this, I can get an actual idea how many, I don't know, F-sharp programmers, how many C-sharp programmers, how many JavaScript programmers are in a country related to the population of the country. Nice. The only thing is, well, where are the people really? The only thing is, how do I know what's the population of each country? And type providers to the rescue, because there is another type provider. And this one actually uses HTML files. So I can go to Wikipedia. Well, I'll show you the Wikipedia page. So, <laughs> does the internet work? Yes. So, list of countries and dependencies by population. It has some information, and it has a table with the countries and how many people live in there. Nice, I can use that directly. So, I have just the URL. You don't have to go to that website and change it right now to some complete rubbish, because I am using a stable URL of some earlier edit. And I can again use type providers, because they will give me a nice typed access to all the information in that table. So I will create another type called wiki, and this time it will be the HTML provider. And just give it the sample URL. This demo depends very much on the speed of the internet, so bear with me if it doesn't work very well. So I'll just get the sample, and now I can do I can extract a table from that website. I don't have to parse anything. So if I do wiki dot, it tells me, okay, do I want to access the source HTML, or do I want to access list on that website, or do I want tables? And yeah, I want tables. 
And from the tables, I want countries and dependencies by population. Easy. Now I got almost everything I wanted. So now I can do table.rows. And in the table, I can do, let's say, map. Row, row, dot. OK, do I want the column called percent of world population, or the country, or the date, or the population, or the rank? I don't have to, well, in some languages, you have to look at, like, on one side of the screen on the actual table, and then map it to the code, and extract it through that. Here, you just get everything here. So I can look at the country, and I can look at the percent of world population, let's say. And if I run this, just to prove my point, maybe I should add a print. I'll just print it. All right. This should work. OK, so now I get all the information from the table. And I know that, mm, let's skip past the small countries. It's quite a large table, actually. So for example, Germany has 1.1% po popula of the Earth's population. And China has 18.5% of the world population. Easy peasy. Well. It took me very few lines to actually get all the information, and now I can use it in my code. So I used that, and I plugged it into my uh, equation. So where are really the programmers? Well, this is an example of it, F-sharp. And you can see that if you are an F-sharp programmer, you should probably be either in the UK or in Scandinavia. Nice. This is NDC. So... This somehow correlates with the locations. And here I will just load some code to uh, look at some other countries or some other languages. This might take a little longer because it's loading all the information. <laughs> or did it finish? Yeah, it's finished. So how does it look for C sharp? C sharp looks fairly similar, but there are more C sharpers in Iceland than F sharpers. So maybe F sharp should expand into Iceland. Well, it behaves slightly strangely for very small countries because there is quite a large uh, probability of getting an outlier. And then I thought, well, uh, is it actually telling me the truth? So I decided to try something that's, that will be probably quite regional. And I decided to look at Erlang. And Erlang is actually most used in Sweden, which is the country that made Erlang. So it kind of probably makes sense. And the second one is China. I'm not sure what they are doing in China with Erlang. The firewall. <laughs> <laughs> we maybe don't want to know. So does anyone have a, their like, favorite language that they want to know where it's used? Python. Python. Well, as I said, it behaves strangely for small countries like Iceland, but it seems, well, if you look at the, if you ignore the outliers, it seems it's used in all the countries that are programming. So that's not actually telling you anything, that, anything like very interesting. What about Fortran? Oh, yeah, it's not one of the uh, very... Oh, yeah, thank you, Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is some outlier somewhere. I have to fix the code to actually ignore some of the outliers because there are some, some very small countries that are outliers, and then it shows sort of very bleak colors. But let's say, well, for example, in Norway, according to my estimation, there are about 25 programmers per million doing Fortran. 
In England, there are about 18. Uh, I gave this talk in Copenhagen, and some guys came to ask me, what about APL? Because they are using APL in Copenhagen. And I plotted it, and turns out the only country that stood out was uh, Denmark. So <laughs> it was probably just those guys. So let's go back to the talk. And as I mentioned, there were some outliers. And one of them that was an outlier for a lot of languages was the Dominican Republic. So I'm imagining all these digital nomads sitting on a beach and asking questions on Stack Overflow. So if you want to move somewhere after Brexit, well, probably choose the Dominican <laughs> Republic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's not very precise because it depends on how frequently people are likely to give their location in Stack Overflow. And for, other, for some countries, it will be very different from some other countries. Some countries, people are more than happy to give their location. Some other are a bit more careful. So take this with a grain of salt. So what else can we do with the Stack Overflow data? Well, I have information on tags. I have information on users. And this is kind of nice, because this sort of gives me like a community structure. Because I can look at groups of users that ask or answer questions with the same tag. So for example, if I look at people who ask and answer questions with F Sharp, this will probably give me a community of people who use F Sharp. And I can look at other uh, languages that I also use. So tags in s uh, sort of define relations. And if I take my friend Chris again, for example, well, uh, how I can formalize this? Well, I use F Sharp, I don't use C Sharp, sometimes I use JavaScript, sometimes I use R, and I don't use COBOL. So this sort of gives me a binary vector that defines my behavior. And Chris uh, uses F Sharp, uses C Sharp, uses JavaScript, doesn't use R, doesn't use COBOL either. So now I know that we are similar in F Sharp and JavaScript, and we are different in C Sharp and in R. And if I apply this to all the users, I have a matrix. And if I have a matrix, I'm a happy data scientist. So altogether, there are 44,000 tags and over 5 million users. So that's kind of a big matrix, and most of it are zeros. So I decided to concentrate on a smaller subset. So I took just users with more than 1,000 posts. There are quite a lot of them and tags that have more than 5,000 posts. That means the tags that are used a lot. And this gave me 800 tags and 1,600 users. And these are power users. So they use some technologies, and they use them a lot. And they answer a lot of questions. So what can I do with it? Well, as a proper data scientist, I have to visualize things. And this TSNE, the T Distributed Stochastic Neighborhood Embedding, it's quite a mouthful, uh, is a very nice method to visualize very complex high-dimensional data. And I will try to give you some idea how it works. I don't want to go into details, so don't be afraid. But the key word here is embedding. And embedding means, that in this case, that you are basically embedding a very high-dimensional space. In my case, if I look at the users and the tags, I will have say, 800 tags that I want to embed into two-dimensional space based on how they behave across users. So it's an embedding of a very high-dimensional space into 2D, and that I can visualize. So how does it work? Imagine a 1,000-dimensional space. Uh, well, imagine I have a 2D space that's sort of curved in 3D space, let's say a sheet of paper. And if I have these two points on the paper, they are sort of very close in space in the 3D, but in the logic of the data, they are very far from each other. So what TSNE does, it looks at just local neighborhood of each point. And it tries to map very similar points to very similar locations in the 2D projection in the embedding. And if points are very far from each other, then it will just put them somewhere. So it optimizes the local neighborhood, and it ignores larger distances. Very, uh, very confusing or OK-ish. It just tries to preserve local distances. So how, I, how would I compute that? Well, in R, you just call a library called TSNE, and you just run an algorithm called TSNE. Easy. 
In F sharp, you can do exactly the same because you can call R from F sharp using something called R provider. So the only difference is that now I have to open an R provider and then open the library within it and call basically the same thing. Well, if you do r.plot, uh, the result, you get something like this. Amazing, right? <laughs> yeah, R is an amazing language because it contains libraries for everything, but yeah, this is kind of not, so, not such a nice visualization. So this is the point where you probably want to use something else. Like, yeah, well, the best thing about R is that it was written by statisti statisticians, and the worst thing about R, it was written by statisticians. So at this point, I decided to go for JavaScript, but because I'm doing things in F-sharp, I use it, used Fable, which is an F-sharp to JavaScript compiler. And yeah, if you go from something like R to JavaScript, you can do things like optimize label placement so that they don't overlap too much, which is nice. And in R, you probably can't even do that. So if I look at it into a bit more detail, so this is one cluster in the visualization, and it sort of tells me uh, about the community structure or like what, what, uh, what languages and what technologies are used by similar people. So this is a little cluster of people doing Androids and Google technologies. So there is like Android, Android activity, layout, etc. Makes sense, kind of. This is another cluster of people doing a lot of web stuff. So in the top is JavaScript and Node.js, then for some reason Google Maps, and then Canvas, Angular, etc., Angular JS, TypeScript. So it kind of tells you something about what technologies are closely related. And this algorithm doesn't have any idea about the actual technologies, but it could figure out that based on who uses them, what are the similar things? And this is another little cluster of people being confused about uh, object-oriented uh, concepts. Yeah, polymorphisms, iterators, perform constructors, inheritance, etc. And because I'm using Fable, I can even do something like this. Like, let's look at F sharp, and F sharp is here. Yeah, you probably can't see when I hover my mouse, but it's saying F sharp. And what's next to F sharp? Let's say this is mono. So F sharp people are more likely to use mono, at least the ones that are on Stack Overflow. And if I look at C sharp, C sharp is up here. And what's next to C sharp? It's .NET. So <laughs> that kind of tells you that the F sharp community is a bit more open, probably, than the C sharp community, at least based on how people ask questions on Stack Overflow. And hopefully I'll be able to prove you that it's using F sharp. Oh, so didn't want that. <laughs> so uh, here I should be able to look at the sources. And this is my F sharp code that actually got compiled into JavaScript. And I can even debug it in F sharp because here I can set a breakpoint rerun it, and it should stop there, and it stopped at the breakpoint. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. So now you can use F-sharp everywhere. <laughs> and you should definitely, uh, you should give uh, Fable a try because it's a very nice library. And I believe tomorrow, Thomas over there is giving a talk that will include much more Fable than here. So, and this algorithm, the TSNE, it's used quite a lot even in my work because you can visualize a lot of different things. Like for example, this is visualizing the genetic diversity among people, among humans. And different communities that live in different places on the Earth are separated. And you can see which ones are like closer together and which ones are more different. So for example, this is Chinese people, and this lower corner is the ones that are living in uh, US, and these ones are the ones that are living in, uh, in China. And these are Japanese people. So you can see that they are genetically closer than the rest of the people. So you can visualize very, very, very high dimensional data sets with this. 
But so I looked at tags, I looked at users, I looked at various technologies, but I haven't even looked at the questions and the answers yet. Well, it's quite a lot of text, so what can I do with that? Well, I decided to use another method that does embedding, and this is called word to vec And from the name, you can probably guess what it does. It tries to map words into vectors. And this is quite complicated, but the key word here is embedding again. It's basically embedding words into some kind of vector space. And I don't want to go into too much details on how it does that, but TSNI was looking at points and their local neighborhoods, which was where other points, and defining an embedding into two dimensions. What word to vec does, it looks at words and their local contexts in sentences and maps that into a vector space. How that does that, it's complicated. I don't want to go into that but it's using neural networks to do that. But again, it's just mapping words and their local context. So if I look at two sentences, like f -sharp is a functional language on the .NET platform, and Scala is a functional object-oriented language on a JVM. From this, you can see that the sentences are very similar in a way. They use mostly similar words, but you can see that the object of the first sentence is f -sharp, and on the second is Scala. So these are probably programming languages, or they are used in a similar place in the two sentences. And .NET and JVM, they are also used in similar place in the sentences. And they are surrounded by similar words. And if you look at large texts, you can extract this kind of relationship. So, and the cool thing is that once you have your words in numbers, yes? Yeah. So the question is, uh, does it understand the English grammar or is it just looking at positions of words in text? It's looking at the neighboring words of each word. So if two words are surrounded by similar words all the time, that means they are similar. So I could take German and put it into exactly the same algorithm and I'll get, I'll get the same results that I like Can you take German and put it into the, exactly the same place in the algorithm and you get the same thing? No, because in German, words are surrounded by German words. In English, they are surrounded by English words. So they are different. Right, right. But would, yeah, but you can, you can use it on any language you want. So the cool thing is, once you extract this sort of relationship and em encode it in a numerical vector, you can do mathematical operations with words. So you can do J Scala and subtract JVM and add .NET. What do you think you get? Well, actually, the closest thing based on this algorithm is C sharp, and the second closest thing is F sharp. Interesting. How could it say that Scala is more object oriented than F sharp? So the closest might be C sharp. Uh, another thing if I do F sharp and subtract .NET, any guesses what I might get? Well, SML and OCaml. It's an ML family of languages. So the closest matches are other ML languages that are not on .NET. That's amazing. It extracted this just from how F sharp is used in sentences. Really nice. And then Haskell and Idris, which are other program, functional programming languages. So actually based on how people use the term F sharp in sentences, F sharp is much closer to Haskell than to C sharp, or at least based on how people use it in sentences. So this kind of thing is used quite a lot even in academia, in what I work on. These are some examples of academic papers. Uh, that, because it would be nice to, I work a lot with genes, and it would be nice to have sort of algorithm that tells you, okay, so this gene that's involved in cancer, if I just transfer it into a different tissue, what other genes are affected there? And you can extract this sort of relations sometimes from scientific literature. If you just let the algorithm read a lot of papers, it might come up with something. So this is a very cool idea of extracting relationships between elements from giving the algorithm a lot of text. But now, well, 
let's go into some like proper questions. Here, these are just some fun facts about like how people use technologies on Stack Overflow. So, is Stack Overflow a meritocracy? Meaning, if someone asks a question and you answer, will the score that you get for your answer actually reflect how good your question or uh, if how good your answer was? <coughs> so, is Stack Overflow a meritocracy? So this is what I plotted. We can look at uh, how much the score you get for an answer depends on your reputation that you already have. If the score you get depends a lot on the reputation you already have, that might mean that people just look at your name and just upvote. Yeah, that's a good guy. Yeah, Let's give him more votes. So this is how it looks if you just plot it. Well, it doesn't tell you much because there are a lot of people with low reputation and like very various scores. This is how, you, how it looks if you plot it on logarithmic scale. So both axes are logarithmic. And this already tells you something quite interesting. So if your reputation is about 1,000, then you probably don't get more than 100 for your answer. There are some outliers here, but there are not that many. And if your reputation is one, then you probably get like one for your answer, maybe. So there might be some relation but nothing really clear. So what I did, uh, I used one machine learning method <laughs> called regression. So I tried to predict, given some data, predict what will be the score you get for your answer. And the input data can be anything. So what I used were actually all the answers on Stack Overflow. There were 18 million of them. And I looked at if the question was accepted, what was the question score, uh, what were the number of tags on the question, how many people tried to answer that, how many people commented on the question, uh, how many people favorited the question, etc., etc., etc. A lot of different inputs. And I tried to predict what will be the score you get for your answer based on all this information, including what's your reputation on Stack Overflow. And the results were, no, I tried a lot of different methods various standard, less standard regression methods. The results were fairly similar. You can predict only a certain amount of the score. But the most predictive uh, elements in the inputs were actually how many people favorited the question. That reflects how many people find the question interesting. Uh, how many people looked at the question, probably Googled it, and if your answer was accepted. That's kind of nice, right? Chuck Norris approves, because that means that the quality of your answer really matters. Uh, and then I was looking at some diagnostic plots. Again, it's not really that important what this really means. But on the y-axis, it basically tells you how different are your predictions from the actual score you get for your answer. So not that much. And on this axis, it tells you something called leverage which is one indicator that tells you how much some groups of data influence the outcome. And this is leverage. And it literally tells you, okay, are some uh, data that are outliers just basically pushing your whole prediction somewhere else? So, for example, this guy here is leverage because uh, he can move, if he moves up, then the whole prediction will move up a little. So this guy has a high leverage. So I looked at this plot and I noticed, well, there is kind of like a, a lot of points that have very high leverage and that are sort of outliers from the rest. So they are probably affecting my prediction a lot. And then I looked at these points in more detail. I looked at what do they actually correspond to because they are outliers. They are very far from the rest of the data. And it turns out it's all John Skeet. <laughs> So if you don't use the Stack Overflow and if you are not asking uh, questions on Stack Overflow, John Skeet is uh, the Chuck Norris of Stack Overflow, especially in C Sharp. So he answers all the questions and he gets much higher score for all of them. So my answer is that quality of your answer really matters. Well, unless you are John Skeet. <laughs> 
Yeah, so this is quite uh, an insight from Stack Overflow. So just to wrap up a little, so on the technological side of things, I was using F Sharp a lot, but I was using a lot of technologies from F Sharp. So I was using JavaScript and R, and I would be using other things as well. So for me, the data science and machine learning is mostly about just finding the right tool for the job. Use whatever you like, but just play with data, because I think you can get quite a lot of information just with playing with data. And this was me playing with Stack Overflow data, and you can download the data as well and play with them yourself. And this is very rewarding, because you understand the data, and you can get quite a lot of out of that. And you saw that I got some interesting insights, some less interesting insights, maybe. And I can do arithmetics with programming languages now. Wonderful. Uh, and on the data science side of things, ask questions. Like, if you have data and if you have questions, then just dig into it and maybe ask questions about it on Stack Overflow uh, and increase the data set. And maybe, maybe, maybe move to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Yes. So the question is, what made me do decide to use Stack Overflow? Well, it's a decent data set that you can download for free, and it's very real world. So it's, you have to wrangle the data a lot, so it gives you sort of a feeling how real world data look like. So although I have a lot of data wrangling to do with my job, uh, this is, it's a real world data set. It's not something that you download and you just play with it for the sake of playing with it. It's a real data set, and it can tell you something about the people as well. So I think it's a really nice and interesting data set. Because I was, for example, playing with the Star Wars data before, which is a data set that I created from movie scripts, but it's sort of artificial a little. It's very small, and yeah, you can play with that, but yeah, Stack Overflow is a decent-sized real-world data set. And it's free to use for your insights. Yes, another question? Uh, could it be a geographical location of R? Oh, geographical location of R, of course. Mm, yeah, R. R. R is used a lot in Northern Europe, in China. What are they doing in China? Uh, Australia and Northern America, which is kind of obvious. It's in Europe, it's used quite a lot in Switzerland, more than in Germany. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably banks are using R. Kind of makes sense. And then, yeah, Netherlands is using R a lot. And in the UK, it's again quite popular. And Scandinavia. So again, if you want to use R and move somewhere after Brexit, either go to Scandinavia, Switzerland, or maybe Australia or New Zealand. Yes. How, how do you know when to bring R in? Do you, do you do sort of systematic to that job? What, what point do you feel R? So what, at what point do I feel to bring in R? Well, R has libraries for everything. F Sharp doesn't have libraries for every, everything, and I think a lot of languages don't have libraries for everything. But uh, data related, you use either R or Python because they have libraries. And R is very straightforward to use from F Sharp. So you can use type providers to load your data into F Sharp, process them, filter them, etc., and then just call R to do the data science stuff and then get results back into F Sharp. I didn't show the R provider here live because that's actually quite a time consuming algorithm to compute, but it works very nicely. Any other questions? If not, there will be a machine learning panel in the next section, so come to that one. And if you want to know my opinions on some things in R, come to PubConf on Friday. Thank you. <laughs>